by Matthew Ross, the Director of Continuing Education at Longwood Gardens. On behalf of Executive Director Jen Ainsworth, the Wild One staff in Nina, Wisconsin, the Honorary Directors, and the Wild Ones National Board, we're excited to welcome you to tonight's webinar. This presentation will be recorded for you to review and to share with fellow Wild One members and friends and family that might be interested in learning more about native plants. You'll notice that your camera and microphone have been turned off. And if you have any questions for tonight's presenters, we ask that you use the question and answer tab at the bottom of your screen. If you are using a mobile device, that might be on the right hand panel or you might need to swipe to find that. Today, we're celebrating the hard work and dedication of Wild Ones. And that as a national board, we were looking for a way to progress the native plant movement to provide uh, tangible and actionable plans to chapter members. Sorry. Uh, to, and our members and sought out grant assistance for this incredible undertaking. There are currently seven designs that have been completed from Chattanooga, Chicago, Milwaukee, Minneapolis, St. Louis, Tallahassee, and Toledo. And we're working on plants for the Boston Basin as we speak. The designs were created with the premise that using native plants and landscaping can be beautiful, promote wildlife, and be achievable for gardeners of all skill sets in terms of scope and budget. Each of the designs, and you'll hear about more of this with the designers tonight, includes at least 15 or more native species, uses multiple plants rather than specimen plantings, favors species with long and staggered bloom times to enhance the ornamental nature of gardens and provide pollen and nectar throughout the season. They took into consideration site conditions, including soil texture and type, pH, and other condi conditions such as moisture, sunlight, that are typical for the specific ecoregion. Each design includes an incremental approach to developing the plan, adding new areas and native plant species as time and funds permit. Carmen Simonette is a landscape architect with a passion for using native plants. She has over 25 years of experience providing landscape, master planning, and site design services for commercial developments, public parks, and private gardens. She is the owner of Carmen Simonette Design LLC. And recent projects include designing a natural playscape for a child development center, consulting on the landscape design for a cons conservation development, designing lakeshore buffer plantings and residential gardens, seeking to replace lawn with natural habitat. Carmen received her BLA and MS in landscape architecture from the University of Minnesota. We'll then talk about your next designer. So your next designer is Susie Van Der Riet. Susie is the founder of St. Louis Native Plants LLC, whose services include consulting, coaching, design, and education. She obtained her bachelor's in women's studies and an AAS in horticulture. She is an ISA certified arborist and an NIA certified interpretive guide. She has had passion for native plants and has been landscaping with them since 2009. You'll notice there's a couple links that were just put into your chat box if you'd like to know more about Susie. She is served as a education subcommittee chair of Grow Native and has participated with the St. Louis Audubon Society's Bring Conservation Home program as a habitat advisor. She's a member of Grow Native and Wild Ones. Thank you very much and worked as a horticulturist managing 130 acres at Forest Park. Her last yard was platinum certified with the BCH program and she's obtained the same certification for her current yard. She loves sharing the benefits of native plants with others. At this time, I'm gonna invite our speakers to the stage. And if you have any questions during today's presentation, just remember that you can use at the bottom of your screen, similar to what Ruth and Gwen have already done and ask your questions that we'll share with our designers at the end of each of their presentations. So again, each presenter will start. They will talk through their uh, 20 minute presentation, and then we'll answer questions afterwards. So with that, let's get started. So Carmen, if you'd like to share your screen. Okay, I'm working on it. Okay, can you see the slide? Looks good. Okay. Well, good evening, and thank you for joining us. This presentation that I'm going to give is on the design strategies used in the Minneapolis plan. Go 
gardens are dynamic and they are always changing. Aesthetics, habitat, and management work together in this design. The plants have been selected to thrive in the site conditions, to be compatible with each other, and to support wildlife. Natural processes we know are going to shape the garden and good management will guide this process. Now this is an overview of the Minneapolis plan. What you're looking at is a collection of individual gardens matching different kinds of site conditions. Each of the garden areas has been thought through considering the location, potential needs of the garden area, the light, soil, moisture, in some areas, I create a succession of blooms for pollinators. I've also combined plants that will grow well together, matching competitive level and needs for succession and to create a particular experience. So when you look at this plan, what you're looking at is a bunch of individual little gardens, like a woodland garden in loamy clay soils, a prairie garden in full sun, layered habitat, using shrubs and overstory trees and ground covers using park sun to shade. So that's one way to look at this overview. A second way is to look at um, ways of how to lay out the space and create a garden experience. And that is what I do all the time when, you know, a place where I start is I'm thinking about how am I going to shape, how am I going to use this space so these are really good ways of organizing. You know, you're thinking about the paths, you're thinking about the places where people are going to sit. An understory tree adds privacy to a deck, a sitting area surrounded by spring, summer and fall blooming flowers. So this is another way you can look at that overall plan and think about um, how you might adapt it to your site. Now, what I've done with the overview is broken it into three different kinds of categories, one being the prairie gardens and another being woodland, another being the layered uh, bird habitat. So with the prairie gardens, the first thing that we're thinking about is, well, what's the defining characteristic of a prairie? This is one of our native plant communities in our region. And well, it is full sun, right? It is no trees. That's sort of the essence of a prairie. And because of that, these plants are well adapted to, to that situation. That's what you're looking for, is uh, if you have a full sun, meaning more than six hours of sun a day, then you'll be able to grow these plants. And then the next thing you're thinking about is, well, do I have a dry site or do I have a wet site? And when you look at this um, page that I put together, you can read those little labels and get those ideas. Well, do I have dry, do I have music? Music is a is a medium, it's your basic garden loamy soil. Do I have a clay soil? Do I have a sandy soil? Those kind of um, specific conditions are somewhat covered in all these different gardens on this plan. So the strategy here, the big one to remember is that you want to match your plants to the kind of conditions you have. Plants will move around and adapt to their environment. And in my situation, I have a part sun condition in my yard. These plants you're looking at are all prairie plants. Um, and when I planted this particular area, I also had blazing star and rattlesnake master. And those are plants that love full sun. And I was really hopeful, but after a few years, they just disappeared. And what's happening is that these plants are much more adapted. These are plants that really handle that low light condition and they outcompete. You know, all plants are going after the same thing. They all want uh, light and moisture and space. And the plant is, that is most adapted to that situation, the set of environmental conditions that you put the plant in, then those plants will do the best. And so from year to year, this will change too. Certain years when it's really wet, you'll end up with a plant that just really shines. Like I had, of course, I'm always planting. You know, I give you these directions, but at the same time, it's like I'm always um, breaking the rules. So I put in swamp milkweed in, a, in an area because the plant is beautiful and the plant smells good, it attracts wonderful insects. But, you know, after a few years, it was gone. And then one year, 
it just came back. And I know why. It was just a really rainy year and I probably had disturbed the soil. And next thing you know, it, there's swamp milkweed again back in my garden. So the point of this is that plants move around and they adapt. And even if you don't get your condition and plants matched quite right, they're going to figure it out and put them, uh, situate themselves and uh, fill up your garden. So they're working it out, they're creating a continuous cover to keep out, keep out the weeds. And that's exactly what I'm, I'm happy for this, uh, that, that, that they're doing that. So thinking through from beginning to end, you know, you have plants that you've put in, you've got this plan and you've got these conditions and you've gone out and bought your plants and you put them in. So you've got to continue and think about how you're managing your garden. And I throw this one in to remember that leaving seed heads standing in the winter. For me, it's habitat. For me, it's beauty. And um, that's all I've got to say about that. Woodland gardens are another type of plant community, right? And so I have another page put together on that. And the defining characteristic of a, of a woodland, of course, is that it's shady and that it's, um, has overstory trees or understory trees, and it's an accumulation of leaves. That's what you end up with. So it's a really a different kind of environment than, say, prairie, right? Because it is um, um, particular because you have this material that's accumulating and you have shade. So again, we have the conditions ranging from moist soils to dry soils, and you can study this plan and um, identify maybe a type of little area on this plan that will match what you have going on in your yard. The other characteristic of a woodland is the way the plants will um, go through succession, you know, through a year. So for instance, right here is the a blood root. And that's, I'm assuming you can see when I move my cursor around, I'm, I'm moving it and hopefully you're seeing it, but it's little flowers that are quite, it's a spring ephemeral. And they bloom first thing before the trees have leafed out. So that's a defining characteristic of, you know, of that plant and of this community. And then after they have used that, that uh, opportunity, uh, the time that they've just pretty much done their thing and are dying back into the, into the earth, into, this, um, into the leaves, then the other plants in these pictures, the wild ginger and the ferns, will start to unfold and cover the ground. And that's that sequence. And that's what, you ex that's what I expect to see happen in these gardens. You look at the plans and you see a bunch of circles, but those circles are only separate when you put them in. Eventually, you want to see this. You want to see them all come together, intermingle, colonize, and fill that space. You know, Some of the roots, they'll be creeping, and there'll be other ones that are tossing their seed. and um, that's what we want to see happen. And this uh, slide, to me, this is really important because this time of year, this is exactly uh, what happens. Um, let leaves collect on the woodland floor. You know, that's happening in the fall, but right now everyone's blowing them out. I walk through my beautiful neighborhood, all the beautiful gardens, and I, I hear and I see all you know, I hear them blowing it away, all these leaves, and I, and I see the bare soil. And I feel like that's such a missed opportunity. And I think that when people understand and make the connection that if you don't blow your leaves away, then you will, believe me, the plants are going to be able to, to grow and punch through those leaves, no problem. And what you get in, in return is a soil that is uh, richer and more moisture retentive and you have forage for the birds, you have the insects who are overwintering and living. So it's this whole unit, it's this whole circling back um, that is so important. I can't say a much, you know, as much, there's so much to say about this slide. That it's just really important. This is design. This is so essential to understand how you manage your garden is as important as what you put into it. And one other note about these leaves, these plants, the wild ginger and the mayapple, spring ephemerals are beginning to disappear here. There's a bloodroot and um, the trout lily. And my one 
trillium that's been there forever, but isn't really reproducing more than that one plant. Those were all planted, but they keep you know, expanding and growing. There are other plants in this, in this picture. There's Virginia water leaf, and down here there's a violet. And those just came in on their own. So the leaves are how I make the garden. I throw the leaves down and the grass just disappears. And I put the, you know, the next year I start putting some plants in and I just let them keep expanding and filling in that area. And as long as something good is being recruited, like the Virginia water leaf, I'm happy with that. That's great. So when you leave the bare leaves, you have that kind of situation. You've got to get the plants growing and expanding. Otherwise, you're creating an opportunity for anything to come in there. The third type of, of planting page category that I have here is the layered landscape. And that is really emphasizing the understory of trees and shrubs. And on the plan, I have a list of them. Pagoda dogwood, elderberry, surface berry are what you see in this page, on this page here. And the, you know, it's habitat and it's privacy. And the ground layer, again, I can't say it enough times, it's the complete picture, right? You wanna get that ground layer under there too, for all those reasons that I mentioned earlier, it's, it's the habitat. So it's a complete thing that you're trying to build. And above all this under, understory, there's shade trees. So on our existing plan that, that we worked with, there was an existing shade tree. And you, know, you can imagine maybe there's some over in the neighbor's yard here too around this plan. So that it would be the, the big overstory, you'd have this understory. It becomes the cover and it becomes a food source for the birds and insects. I have a series of different kinds of shrubs that I put in this plan on purpose. It's not just one type of shrub. Um, the mixture creates a succession of bloom through the season. So early service burial bloom really early and chook cherry, I'm not exactly sure when, the pagoda dogwood later, red twig dogwood even later. So what happens is things are flowering throughout the year and they're creating uh, fruit throughout the year. And the ground layer, once again, it's just, this can happen with what I have here in this picture, a bunch of different perennial plants, but also shrubs, you know, Davila, uh, dwarf bush honeysuckle is um, an example of one that I put on the plan in the front, um, underneath the, at the front foundation on the shady side. That is a perfect plant to put underneath the understory and just cover that ground. That's what we're after. We're after creating uh, a continuous cover so that other things that we don't necessarily want coming in, growing in. And I say that because, yeah, I mean, a little bit of empty mulch, maybe it is beautiful, but it's also just an opportunity for something to seed in there. Now, another way to think about the drawing, as I said earlier, is that you could think about layout. And so in this case, I mean, that's how I organize space. You know, the first thing that I do is aside from, you know, identifying your site conditions and all the impacts and opportunities you might have or issues, it's about, well, what do I want to do with this? You know, what, what's driving me to do this design? And in this case, it's the client wanted um, a patio and she wanted to be able to be out in the sun. And it, you know, we had to create a patio with a path and it was along the, uh, it's through the north side of the side of her house. So all of a sudden it's created this opportunity for a woodland garden being on the north side of the house. And so thinking through what else do I want? I wanna have privacy. I wanna have private, or they wanna have privacy between their space and the neighbors. So it gave me an opportunity to find some shrubs um, and create that edge. And why I selected this plan or this picture is because of wanting to talk about legibility. And that's about making something really read. You know, for me, it's all about the experience. And this is, this is really a beautiful experience when you come out, it's very deliberate. And when it, it takes a little bit of maintenance, but not that much, but it's, it's more like this person has decided this is the way that she wants to manage this 
native planting. So there's everything here is native. You know, this early meadow rue and the wild ginger over here and the sweet joe pieweed back here and this, all these hedges, penstemon, all sorts of stuff. And then there's this Pennsylvania sedge that you just move through. So she has, um, she has to weed out native, native plants that may seed in here, but it's not a lot of work, especially as this thickens up. So it's just really reads as a beautiful experience and it's all natives. And this area, uh, you know, they, there was a push to do this in sod. And I just thought, why, you know, when we could do it in something that has a similar feeling, but just a really different, um, just as nice as a nicer experience. And so by doing that, I really matched that condition. And this was, uh, this area has an irrigation um, system and this zone was turned off and it's never been irrigated since it's been planted. So, so in just a couple more of that idea where the, you start with your hardscape, you start with how you wanna use the space how you want to use your your garden and for me in this case it was this path that came through um, there's a patio over to the left here and this is a little catchment for uh, the water off the roof and it runs under the path and into a rain garden over here but to me it's like the path frames this woodland it, it enhances it or maybe the woodland garden is, is enhancing the path. I'm not sure which, all I know is that the two create a really divine experience. And um, that to me is what makes it really legible. And then in a, another example, only this time in the prairie, this is a, a conservation development called Wildflower at Lake Elmo. And the big idea was to carry prairie planting throughout the entire development um, through the open spaces, you know, through the, the boulevards and the park areas, as well as through all the residential lots. And it's divided, there's a, these large lot areas, and then there they are smaller lots that are only, I think these are 50 feet, maybe 60 feet wide, but there, there are many of them. There's three different blocks of them. And um, we, the big idea was to take this small wall and circle it all the way around. And that's the entry experience into these houses. So then we can run this prairie, these, these prairie plants, this garden through the front of the houses and it extends and wraps around all the way. And it just cleans it up. And I feel like, you know, it's sort of this happy compromise. A lot of people also wanna have cultivars and I, I try to work at, at shifting it to, the, um, to using the just the natives, but you know, it's a happy compromise and um, we have these uh, lots of areas of just using the native plants as well. So my last slide sums it up. Gardening with native plants takes a holistic approach. It's about designing relationships. We can create a beautiful experience while at the same time habitat for wildlife. It takes connecting the dots between our actions and the goals we want to achieve. These gardens look different because they are different. We can, <laughs> we can shape their wild nature to appeal to our aesthetics, but honestly, there's so much beauty to experience, like a sleeping bee on my asters in the morning, or the sight of a mother rabbit moving her newborn babies one by one into a nest she's made in my garden. And, and I just saw this happen. I just saw this happen a week ago. I'm okay with this. I have plenty of asters to share. I'm all for less lawn and more wild. With that, I'm going to pass the screen to Susie and she can pick up where I left off. Hey, thank you for that introduction. Can everybody hear me okay? Awesome, okay. So, and thank you, Carmen, for that. I feel like there's definitely, um, we definitely have a fair amount of overlap in our presentations and our designs and kind of how, you know, the whole thought process going into them. Let me get this, okay, here we go. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I basically, um, uh, just to introduce my design, 
I look very much at um, gardening as something very simpler to, or similar to composing and conducting a symphony. Has, and this is very much appropriate to St. Louis, Missouri. Have you ever been to Powell Hall to hear or see the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra or wherever you are coming to us from? Um, have you ever been to your local symphony orchestra? And um, something that to me is very similar you know, that I notice when I go to the symphony, and I love going to the symphony, is uh, you see all of these different moving parts. You see, um, you know, the violin section, you see the percussion section, you see, um, you know, or not even just violins, but strings, um, you know, woodwinds, a number of different sections uh, and sounds. And, you know, and some of these things, when they're playing solo, they have their own individual sound, but together they create a whole different collective sound. And native gardens can be very much the same, except instead of musical instruments, we have things like contrasting colors, textures, groupings of plants, which may bloom at different times during the growing season. Or maybe sometimes we have plants that bloom at the same time uh, so that they actually complement each other in their color schemes. Um, and these are just, you know, a few examples of kind of some differences between colors and textures at different times of year. You know, some of these bloom spring into summer. Um, you know, we have some textures with the grasses, the uh, little blue stem, uh, the, the uh, Schizecarum scoparium is really one of my favorites uh, just throughout the whole year. It just does something different all the time and it just looks beautiful. Um, you know, to things like this Rebecca here that gets going a little bit later, uh, you know, and, and this Aster over here a little bit later and, you know, getting towards the fall. And so we can bring those together so that they play off of each other. Resulting in a sequence of blooms and contrast of colors and textures through, throughout every season. And so um, I just have a few slides here uh, kind of highlighting the different um, plants, just a handful of them. Um, as we go through each season that I, that I think look really nice together just to demonstrate that. So, you know, here we have pussy toes, blue wild indigo, Robin's plantain, you know, these are all kind of a little bit earlier. Also the Samsonia, which is, um, shining blue star. Uh, these all kind of are getting going. Um, well, especially these three now, Baptisia is not quite there yet. Um, and uh, this grass, so this is purple love grass, which again, you know, similar to little blue stem has a variety of appearance to it um, throughout different seasons, but has almost more of like a greenish blue sort of appearance a little bit earlier in the year. Um, and then of course we have our, our lovely cone flowers that kind of take us into the summer here and a little bit further into the summer with this purple cone flower, which you can't really see. I was focusing in on that bee there. <laughs> um, and then when we get into summer and fall, you know, some of these, like I said, still have, um, you know, just contrasting textures. They change colors a little bit. So this uh, purple love grass in the center here now is going to be shifting to more of a purple sort of color. We have the Rubecchia, so you've got the beautiful yellows um, going on a little bit further into the summer and into the fall. This is partridge pea here that this little two-spotted longhorn bee is hanging on. And, um, and of course, asters and goldenrods, uh, definitely get going and take us into the fall and the summer. And then fall and even winter, I feel like sometimes this kind of gets neglected a little bit uh, when we're considering multi-seasons of interest throughout the year. And I really think that fall and winter can be some of the loveliest seasons for plant color and textures. When we think about things like bark, you know, and, and um, you know, nine bark being one uh, that has exfoliating bark um, you know, it's just kind of, it's just really beautiful, similar to like a river birch, um, just beautiful bark, shag bark hickory, this lovely fall color, you know, and this other hickory over here, which I'm not entirely sure, uh, what species it is, but that bark, even that is just, you know, really interesting to look at, I think. And then, uh, little blue stem again, we see the different colors and textures going in the fall and the winter. I wouldn't plant this or put this in anybody's design, but poison ivy really has some beautiful fall color to look at from a distance around here, um, as does something like Indian physic. And uh, this is just a whole different type of interest here, fall going into the winter. This is frost flower. Um, Cunelia originoides, uh, which is our common dittany, 
is one of uh, just under a handful of plants native to Missouri that produces something called frost flower. And uh, so this is something that's a whole different thing that we can see, um, you know, as something that's interesting to look at and, and really lovely. So something else to consider when, um, you know, we're considering what goes into a native garden symphony is uh, the goal of attracting and supporting specific wildlife. Now, I'm sure not everybody wants to attract bunnies to their yards, uh, but, you know, this goes all the way down to the smallest of creatures in my mind. So when I'm talking about wildlife, I'm talking like the broad range, you know, throughout the whole food web. And so, um, you know, when we talk about that, flowering plants are very important to support them, but this is actually only one part of a complete habitat. So some of the things, and, and this is touching on some of the some of the items that Carmen touched on too, um, you know, with mulching and things like that. So there's definitely overlap there. And I think uh, some of the important things to highlight as considerations for wildlife is this, this aspect of managing our landscapes a little bit differently. So we have, you know, the flowering plants and all that good stuff and looking at interest and something that's aesthetically pleasing to us as humans. Um, but then taking it a step further, what are ways that we can actually manage the space differently than maybe it has been traditional for us um, to encourage and support more wildlife? And so first to get into that, I would like to say what habitat, what a healthy habitat actually is, which includes the same things that it includes for us, food, space, shelter, uh, down here at the bottom, I didn't put this at top, but uh, a poison-free environment, which is pretty important that we don't live in a toxic environment, uh, but especially for these little beings. And so um, just some examples of what makes up that habitat specifically uh, includes larger contiguous plant clusters for beneficial insects and birds. And this includes things like predatory insects, um, particular plants for birds and bugs. And so, um, you know, when I talk about something like predatory bugs, I'm thinking of things like beetles or wasps or um, flies, mantises, things like that. But, you know, even uh, when we think of beetles, something like firefly beetles, which I know a lot of people have been kind of concerned because they seem to be seeing less of them. Um, so one of the ways that we can actually support things like that is we can include shallow flowering plants um, that don't require these insects to actually have a long proboscis or long uh, straw-like tongue to get deep into the flower. And so things like Coreopsis you know, is a perfect example for that. And then when we have these clusters of plants you know, that produce seeds like Coreopsis, once again, we attract and support things like um, goldfinches. You know, lots of different birds will pick at the seed heads of these things. Um, and so, Further down the list, bare ground for insects that nest in the ground. And so 70% of our bee species nest in the ground. And I love this little photo here. It might show up pretty small on some people's screens, but this was me kind of spying on this little uh, cellophane bee that, um, you know, what's, what's wonderful about that particular bee and what it represents to me is that um, there is an area that I used to manage in the park, in Forest Park specifically, um, that, <laughs> Is this big, sandy, compacted, bare soil with sparse plants throughout, like, you know, spring beauties and things like that that would pop up in the springtime. And these little bees would emerge from the soil every year in the spring without fail in that same area. And they nest in these communal kind of areas or, or settings, and they stand guard at their nest. So once they actually, you know, the males come out and they mate with females and then the females as they're nesting will actually guard these nests and they're like little crabs when you sneak up on them and then suddenly they notice you're there and they retract into the hole and they're just they're adorable I think and um, but that's why you know it's it's not necessary to say well we can't put plants there but more necessary to say we don't need to be putting two to three inches of hardwood mulch um, on the ground because it actually discourages things like this um, from being able to find their appropriate habitat to nest. Bunch grasses, great shelter for um, overwintering insects. And also, you know, I've, I've noticed the firefly beetles actually in our yards seem to like to take shelter during the daytime in here and then crawl up out of it uh, at night when they are about ready to light the sky in our yard. And uh, so that's, but that's just one example. There's so many bugs that, that take shelter in those bunch grasses. 
It also can be, bunch grasses can be a really great nesting site for bumblebees as well. Um, leaving an area of rotting wood, twigs, brush pile, uh, this can be really useful for the other 30% of our bee species who um, prefer to actually nest in things like this rotting wood here or in stems. It's also a great spot for predatory bugs and for birds to hunt for their food. And then leave the leaves. I keep telling people this, we don't need to have these really tidy gardens. Um, leaving the leaves is a really good way to support things like this bumblebee queen here who was hiding her head from me when I was trying to get this photograph of her in our yard. This was about this time last year, maybe a little bit further into the year. And um, you know, they will take shelter under leaf litter. They will take shelter in loose soil, maybe even a little bit of light mulch. Um, or in rotting wood, you know, hollow cavities, things like that uh, to overwinter, and then they will start a whole new colony the following year. So definitely important for them. Including a water feature or bird bath. This is also a great thing to do to support birds. Uh, it's one of the most important things from what I understand, according to the Audubon Society, uh, even more important than providing food through the winter time. And a poison-free environment, as I mentioned, uh, you know, sometimes I realize that we have to apply things like pesticides um, but as much as we can possibly avoid this in the exterior of around our house and our property and, um, you know, can really think about and, and question what we are applying and how it impacts other things besides our target, because frequently it does do th that much. Um, it affects other things. Uh, we just, you know, need to definitely take, take that responsibility seriously. So um, from here, so we've talked about kind of all the different kind of fun factors, I think, that go into a native garden. And then, you know, I think it's also important, and, and Carmen already kind of touched on this, we have to consider the site. We have to do a site analysis and a site plan. Um, you know, we base this on the conditions that are present at, you know, particular sites. So I am actually, I'm not going to focus on all of this, but you certainly, if you were going to apply any of this design to your own yard, you can take these things piecemeal and say, well, I have a shadier, wetter corner in my backyard and so, or even in my front yard. And so the plants that I have selected for this particular area in my design are going to be suitable for those conditions for, you know, something that gets periodic wetness and then dries out maybe during the summertime and also gets a fair amount of shade. And the area that I am actually going to highlight tonight um, is going to be more of um, mimicking a dry sort of woodland area with periodic wetness. Um, so this area over here being on the east side is going to, and, and again, you know, similar to what Carmen was saying, probably considering that there might be a little bit of shade over here too on this side in the neighbor's yard, um, or even by a fence here. So this is going to get a little bit of sun, but, you know, largely during the day is going to get shade and especially in, from the hot sun later in the day, it's going to be getting shaded. So when I selected the plants for this, that, that just knowing that bit of information helps me to figure out what plants I'm going to apply to that space. And I wanted to, uh, so I'm going to take a little bit of a snippet out of this. And you know, when, when I was first tasked with doing this design, I remember asking wild ones, well, how much, you know, how, how much do you want me to design for the yard? You know, can I, and, and, and in my mind, I like to dream big. I don't know if you can see that up at the top here. It seems like my screen's blocking it, but um, I like to dream really big when it comes to native plants. And so the more turf that I can replace in my yard and hardscapes and all of that, uh, that is what I want to do. So, um, but this can certainly be done in incremental planting. Um, this can be done just taking, like I said, one little snippet of it and applying it. And so this is, you know, I, I say that so that when people look at it, hopefully they don't feel terribly overwhelmed because this does not have to be your whole product when you go to apply this to your yard if you decide to. So just really briefly, I'm going to talk through um, this particular section of the garden on the east side, I decided to call this the east garden, a tiny bit of woodland because it's pretty much essentially what I'm, what I'm mimicking here. And we talked about the site conditions that are present, so mostly dry. 
Um, you know, this is a very narrow space here. So there's, there's actually, I did this for a client you know, a couple of years ago, uh, did a design and this was planted in the fall. This is actually these plants uh, maturity level. This is after their first full um, summer was how they looked. And so, um, you know, frequently, you know, sometimes we'll have more space to work with. But, uh, you know, in my, my neighborhood, I live in the city of St. Louis, and we have very small yards. And we have these little itty bitty, you know, spots between houses um, that, you know, could just be concrete in some places that is the case. Uh, but this particular client had um, turf grass in this mostly shaded area that they had to also irrigate and had to mow. And um, so when I met with them, we talked about, well, what are some ways that we can, you know, help the, you know, make this uh, better for absorbing, you know, rainfall when that happens, but also making it so you don't have to irrigate it, making it so you don't have to um, mow it and making it a pleasant place to walk through, basically just to go from the front of your house to the back of your house. And so, you know, it's one of those things where maybe it's not a top priority, but maybe you don't have a lot of other spaces to work with. And so um, this can just be a really cool way to convert a space that is small and, and otherwise, you know, not necessarily really exciting to look at. And so um, just going through some of these plants, uh, these plants are mostly reflective of what is actually in this garden here. So um, I have Indian pink, which, and you'll note that I clustered, you know, there's repetition and Carmen talked about some of these principles too. Um, definitely, I have some repetition here. You can see some consistency throughout. So this will help to create a little more uniformity. Um, but what I ultimately want to do, you know, want to happen and what I'm going for with this is to have a ground cover that suppresses weed growth, that makes it so that mulch does not have to continually be brought in here. Um, that the moisture will be kept in the soil a little bit more effectively from um, these plants that are shading the soil, and uh, but also just it will help to suppress the weeds from coming in. So um, Indian pink is going to be, you know, a nice uh, little more formal kind of native plant that um, will definitely attract hummingbirds. And so I have a few clusters that I put in here of that. This is probably the tallest plant I would say say of any of the plants in this section because I did not want to overwhelm the space and have somebody feel like they were going to be walking through an area where plants are falling in on them. So we definitely want to be sensitive to that when we're designing and, and making sure that the plant actually fits the space. Uh, wild ginger, so this is going to be a nice leafy ground cover. The flowers are cool, somewhat inconspicuous. Um, you know, they have their own benefit as well, but this will form a nice mat of greenery. It was something that Carmen highlighted in her design as well. Uh, groundsel. So this is something, and, and this particular species is obovata. We also have another species that's native here called Oria. Um, this one does well in dry shade with a little bit of sun. And what I love about this plant is not only is it supporting spring emerging pollinators, uh, but it also has these evergreen leaves. So this is something that continually creeps out, you know, from the center more and more each year and forms also a nice mat. So this will be really great for suppressing weed growth as well. And then this actually blooms in tandem with this Jacob's Ladder and Jacob's Ladder also. So this is going to be something that's good for spring emerging pollinators as well. And this will set down a little bit of seed and fill in its space maybe a little more slowly than something like this groundsel. But these beautiful bell-shaped you know, flowers in contrast with these kind of you know, rays almost uh, and then this, I mean, Indian pink is, is a flower all in its own class, just beautiful. And as far as bloom periods go, we've got this going, you know, somewhat, you know, June into July. Uh, with this, we've got earlier, you know, kind of spring. And Dittany is going to be more getting into the fall a little bit, late summer, early fall. And then as I had discussed before, frost flower is something that it produces. And so this is going to be a whole nother level of interest. And I love putting this plant next to paths because of the fact that it produces frost flower. So if anybody like myself, uh, as I tend to do during the fall and winter time, 
uh, once you get up early and go out and see if frost flower is present on these things, then they have a pathway right next to it to be able to do that. So that is important. Uh, and I, I like that about paths, that not only does it give you kind of a theme and a common thread through this, uh, but it, and, and also borders, you know, kind of what Carmen was talking about, that the plants, you know, and the, the flagstone path really have this really neat play off of each other uh, and accent to each other. It's just beautiful. Um, but it does create this continuous sort of, um, well, continuity through the garden and then also makes it so you can actually engage with your landscape. And then I don't actually have this picture over here, but oak sedge. So that's uh, something else that I included in clusters. And this is also semi evergreen here and will provide just a beautiful contrast, as you can see, of this just really delicate, fine foliage uh, with some of the other leafy plants. And will create a nice mat as well to help suppress weeds once again. And this is also a host plant uh, for I'm not sure what type of Lepidoptera. I want to say skippers, but I could be wrong about that. So. Uh, and Dittany, I have seen a lot of bumblebees on as well as smaller bees. Just wanted to mention that too, as far as their wildlife benefit goes. So kind of concluding here and bringing it to a close, um, just, a, just some final thoughts to, to leave you with. I think one of the most important things for me has been, um, you know, to really learn from my own observations and to really learn from my personal experience. So, you know, when I first got into garden design and gardening with natives, um, I just would pick a plant and throw it in my yard. You know, kind of what Carmen would say is like breaking the rules. You know, it's like everything that I don't tell people to do today, um, just going and getting plants and throwing them in my yard. And I learned a lot from doing that. And so I don't necessarily totally discourage people from doing that approach just because, you know, you can have a plan and it's great to have a plan, but your, your own knowledge and experience is going to be just amazing. So uh, that will ultimately help you to understand everything better. And, uh, and I love that quote, you know, in tandem with all of these little bugs on plants, you know, the spicebush swallow cat swallowtail caterpillar, um, how much they mimic a snake this dragonfly who has camouflaged itself somehow perfectly or just found the perfect flower to mimic the colors on its body. It's just amazing. And this camouflage blooper uh, who disguises itself with different little increments of plants like this Rudbeckia, I think that it's on, I'm pretty sure it's a Rudbeckia. Um, and, uh, you know, just if we sit still long enough, we can really learn a lot from these things about our landscapes and about our surroundings. I also like to remind people to have fun. Bunnies can be a pain for a lot of people. Uh, but as Carmen was talking about, I think she was saying she had some bunnies that just started nesting in her yard. So did I. And I am just loving every moment of it. And I know that as soon as they're big enough to move out of their nest, they're going to be nibbling on my plants. That's okay. I'll use some of those plants as a trap crop for them. I have other plants that are just, you know, kind of uh, just getting going and not quite mature yet. So I have a fence around them. And it's just something that I just realized it's just kind of, you know, bunnies are voracious predators like this velociraptor here. So uh, slightly different way, but. So, and just to conclude, you can create a beautiful outdoor symphony that is beneficial to you, the environment and wildlife. And I think that this is one of the neatest um, things that made me fall in love with native plants is that I feel like it's a message of hope that we can in fact coexist uh, with all of these little beans and with these plants, and we can have a beautiful yard and a beautiful landscape that we love to look at. But what takes it up a notch even more is just knowing that because we've planted this, we're attracting all of these little beans into our yards and we're able to support them and, and make a difference with our little corner of the earth. So um, I hope that that has inspired any or all of you. And I hope that, you know, uh, you'll continue to get out there and, and plant some more natives. And um, with that, I just want to say thank you, everybody, for your attention and listening. And I'm assuming that you haven't fallen asleep, even though I can't see you. So <laughs> thank you. I don't think anybody's fallen asleep yet because the number of questions we've gotten has been fantastic. So uh, Carmen, if you want to turn your uh, microphone on, I think people would love to hear from both of you. And I have a couple questions that I'd like to start things off with that seem to be themes throughout tonight's presentation. So the first one was, I know that when we first talked, you mentioned the use of AutoCAD and Dynascape for your designs respectively. 
but for a lot of homeowners like Gwen and Sally and others, they wanted to know what program would you recommend for someone that's looking at getting starting and designing either their yard or another's? Well, one thing I can say is I'm old enough that when I started, I used pen and pencil, paper. <laughs> that is one way to do it. And it works. And I know people who continue to do that. And um, even people who are designing for clients, they're still using um, paper and pencil. I said pen and pencil, paper and pencil. So that is one way. You know, I use AutoCAD light. Um, it's yeah, there is a cost to it. And I, I don't know of free programs because I don't I don't need one, so I haven't looked for one. How about you, Susie? I would echo a lot of that. I, I started out with sketching um, before I got into it professionally. I certainly was sketching everything. And the reason that I was drawn to Dynascape is it seemed like a solid plan, but I got introduced to it through horticulture school. So I honestly, I think that that's, been part of my hesitancy to really try and explore anything else and kind of like what Carmen was saying that I don't necessarily have to. Um, so that's just what I've stuck with because it works for me. Great. A lot of our uh, attendees wanted to know when they're getting started, uh, what challenges uh, they presented were things like competition with grass and competition with wildlife if they're the only plants that are out there. So if you were getting started with the gardens from the ground up and you were dealing with competition from herbivory, you had some native or some invasive species that you might be removing and removing grass, how would you tackle getting started for the very first time? I can go first if you'd like me to, Carmen, since you want. Go ahead. Okay, so um, I think, and, and I guess is the assumption that, that they haven't planted anything yet or yes. they have planted it and it's a problem. Haven't planted anything yet. They're dealing with uh, competition from grass, competition from invasive species like vinca was mentioned, for instance. Okay. Um, and also competition from uh, bunnies that we mentioned multiple times <laughs> that were yes. the true raptors of the landscape there. Yes. Okay. So thank you. Um, get rid of the existing vegetation where you're going to be planting this stuff as best as you can from the beginning. So that's where, you know, I think sometimes there's a problem where, you know, if we have a tendency to uh, try to move through it too quickly, because we're in a hurry and we want to get, we want to execute our plan. We want to, we want to put the plants there and we want to do it now. Um, the problem with that is that then we end up battling those, those species that we need to really get rid of first. So that would probably be my biggest tip is out of the gate, take care of the existing vegetation first before you even put any of your plants in that soil. Uh, because ultimately that will, give it, that will give your plants a chance to breathe and you won't have to be fighting it um, all along. And with uh, now it's a whole different story. I think if you already have planted your plants and you have things that are encroaching on the space. And I think one of the best things that I could say about that is just stay on top of it and don't let it become a huge problem. If it does become a huge problem, you might have to look at maybe digging out your plants, you know, your native plants, and then maybe starting fresh uh, if it becomes too big of a problem. And I have seen that happen before with like Bermuda grass. Um, you know, where that creeps in and then it just goes crazy and it weaves itself through another like native grass or something like that. And sometimes it just seems like a good idea to cut your losses and just say, you know what, I'm just going to kind of start this fresh. Putting edging on your beds can work wonders for like actually digging a two inch edge down around your beds to separate things like grass or weed turf, whatever you want to call it, uh, from getting into your garden beds as well. Um, there's a lot of different suggestions on the wildlife part of it. I like to use uh, chicken wire because I think that that's maybe one of the best successes that I've had with keeping um, animals out of um, my garden beds. Uh, I've tried a lot of other things like sprays, you know, all like natural kind of stuff. And that stuff just doesn't seem to work quite as well. And I'm curious if maybe Carmen might have different experience with that and maybe some good ideas with that. Sure, I'll give my two cents about um, removal of lawn, I think is one of the easiest things if it's just lawn, um, not having other weeds in it. And I have tried every way there is. I've, I've rented the sod kicker and rolled it up and that's really easy to do. 
I've dumped leaves, um, all the leaves in our, uh, from all our trees in our yard. We've never gotten rid of any of them. We just push them over. I know there's issues with leaves and I'm, I'm a big thing in our, I've been hearing is about these jumping worms, but I don't think I have them in my yard. I don't even know what they are really, but there's gonna be a talk on it, Wild Ones, or maybe there already has been one for the Twin Cities chapter. Uh, Julia Venata is really, um, she's out on top of it and looking into that. But the point then is, um, so the leaves, and I think that, yeah, you get a lot of uh, weed seeds with those leaves sometimes, you know, like elm and ash and whatever, um, and that can feed into whatever, you know, the new bed you're establishing. But I haven't had an issue really, I don't think of it as a concern. So being able to just suppress it and then plant into it. But like Susie was saying, if you've got a bad weed in there already, and like in the inner city where I am, Virginia or no, creeping bellflower is a really nasty one that a lot of people have to deal with here. It's just an old um, perennial that, that was popular at one time. And now it's just, uh, it's just a mess. It's just hard to deal with. And getting rid of something as invasive as that before you plant would be a lot easier. Um, a different tact that I've taken because I can't rip out everything is finding ways to plant right on top and over these awful plants that I don't like. And so I'm experimenting because my yard's a big experiment. Um, Bermuda grass, I'm not sure that you know, we don't have anything that is, I don't think as tough as that. Probably one of the toughest ones in my own yard is that creeping bellflower. And I find that I've been experimenting with plants that I can put right on top or clean it away as well as I can and then immediately plant in. And it, will my new plant outcompete it or not? That's what I'm aiming for is trying to outcompete. So then in terms of fencing, no, I think the wire fencing is always... I mean, it's just so easy and straightforward and, and the spray thing I've never done. Um, I think people tell me they try them and then they, you just have to keep on it. So um, the, the fencing is the way to go is, you know, if you need to keep things out um, when you initially start. Did I miss anything? Yeah, you got it. Okay. I have two, two let's do two last questions. Uh, the first one I'll direct towards Susie first, because in the style of the symphony, we know that at some point in time, the oboe might be lo louder than the piccolo, and there might be this mix and match of sounds that somehow blend together to make a beautiful uh, composition. And one of the questions was, how do you personally decide which plants do you put next to each other? Do you follow a traditional style? Uh, of matching heights, or do you do more of a matrix design similar to the work that's being done by Thomas Rainier and others um, where they're working kind of on a matrix? That depends. <laughs> um, you know, some of it, it's really a variety, I guess. And sometimes it's just seeing plants working together well. And that's why I said experience is so great. Sometimes it's just seeing plant combinations being like, I really like that. I'm going to use that more. And so um, you know, like one, one thing that I have on my design, which I didn't talk about tonight is um, small skull cap and coneflower, echinacea specifically. And one of my favorite things to do is do like a matrix planting of echinacea paradoxa, which is yellow coneflower and um, echinacea simulata, which is glade coneflower, mix the two together because they bloom approximately the same time. And so you get that comparable height with different colors. And then around the base of it, because it's a lower growing plant is to put something like small skull cap and um, which blooms these beautiful kind of tubular purplish lavender kind of blooms uh, that appeal to small bees and flies. And that like hugs, you know, the foliage of that plant clusters and hugs the base of these taller um, echinacea species. And they all bloom at the same time and it's beautiful together. So I think it kind of depends um, on the, whatever the ideal is for the client and the space and how organized it needs to look too. But, um, so yes, I guess, uh, you know, to answer your question that I, I kind of approach it both ways, I guess, it really depends. And then Carmen, on that same note, uh, if you wanted to keep the same sound across the, uh, the audience and you found a song that you really liked, like your Pennsylvania sedge that you sh shared, and you're trying to keep that essentially as one block of its own, what plants do you avoid or how do you maintain it so that it is just a solid block and potential lawn replacement? Well, it depends. 
<laughs> I think the yeah the ah oh, the the thing the, the qualities of a Pennsylvania sedge are that it's like a sod grass it 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 is rhizomatic and it spreads and that really helps make something easier you know it's colonizing the site and really block you know locking out other plant other plants from having the ability to seed in or, or encroach on the space. So that would be the primary way is you're selecting a plant that's just got a really strong root system. And um, that's that's it. I mean, what was the rest of your question? Keeping it weed free. Uh, yeah. What type of maintenance are you doing to make sure that it's, it's not being um, outcompeted? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's like you're essentially trying to make a little monoculture. I think other ones too, you can still have, I mean, I'm a big fan of matrix planting and it's like tossing seed out there. It's, we've been doing it for literally decades. People have been doing this where you are layering the landscape and that's how you're locking out weeds. So even if you have something really low underneath and then plant something um, coming through that, you may not see what's underneath. Um, and that's, a, that's, it's not necessarily a monoculture, but you are helping to lock out the weeds. So there, those are two different options there. One is you're just using as a plant that has a really tenacious ability to hold the soil and not let other things in. And another one is um, layering with plants of different, something very low that can fill in that area. There's a lot of sedges. Everybody's playing with the sedges, the upland dry sedges. I only mentioned the woodland, the, the pen sedge, but there are many other ones too. And those can be underneath. And then, you know, you can have say a bunch grass come through like the, the prairie drop seed, which doesn't reproduce as well. And so it, it too should, could have a, a layer underneath it. So your maintenance, you're just going to have maintenance and the tighter and, you know, the quicker, the closer you plant it from the beginning, that's that's the solution, I guess, is you put your sedges very, very close together and you start you know, mowing them so that you encourage its growth so that it continues to spread. That will help as well. So you, you just really want a very dense planting. You, know, you can mirror sod. Sod is really a good example of a really dense ground cover. Definitely. And our last question that I'll ask you before we wrap things up tonight, both of you presented residential designs on a traditional lot size. But if someone was going really big, we had people that mentioned multiple acres and trying to get the most bang for their buck and, and try to have the most impact that they could possibly have. What would be one tip that each of you have uh, for someone that's looking at expanding beyond just a residential scale into a much larger um, plot? I'll start with it. I, I do large lots. So obviously seeding is a great way to go after that. I mean, you can cover so much land at once. And so, so approach big bang for your buck is uh, approaching it as a seeding project. And you know whether you're doing it by yourself or really working with a natural resource a company that does it, that's the way I would do it, is have somebody, um, have somebody design a mix for you and look at your site and match that, match your site and then um, have them prepare the site or, you know, you prepare it, but then seed it. Seeding is just, you know, you can cover a lot of ground with that. I guess that would be the, the most cost efficient. I'm, I'm assuming that's what you mean, the biggest bang for your buck. Or most impactful, yes. Yep. Yeah, well, there's other things we could do, but I, I don't know how long, I'll let Susie uh, give us your approach. I actually, I really like that approach. I think I would even, so if you have a little bit more to play with as far as finances go, you could even do a counting of plugs and seed um, so that you have kind of an establishment, a sooner establishment with the plugs. Uh, you can buy them in pretty large quantities from you know uh, different places. And so uh, that would be one way to, I would maybe approach it if you were hoping for a little bit more right off the bat when you plant it, or at least a little bit sooner kind of turn around with it. And um, I would maybe encourage you to, not maybe, definitely, unless you really know uh, how to maintain that and manage that, getting it off the ground, especially the first few years, to work with somebody on stewardship and maintenance or just somehow collaborate with somebody on how to maintain that, whether you hire somebody to do it for you or you yourself are learning how to do that. That really, I think, would be key too because a seeded landscape sometimes, I think, also can be 
an issue for people who are, can't tell the difference between a seed and a weed or don't really know how to maintain it as it's growing. And so I think that's a really important thing that could be lost, but you could get out ahead of that and just be really informed and take care of that out of the gate. Well, that's really valuable insight. I want to thank both of you on behalf of Wild Ones. And I know we didn't get to everybody's questions. So I do want to let you all know that there is a forum for you to connect with your peers through your chapters. So if you're not a member of a chapter right now, each of the Wild Ones chapters put on programs throughout the year that can help you with some of your questions and have great experts there amongst the membership, including one upcoming event that if you are interested, Carmen is gonna be presenting a design webinar with the Wild Ones of Big River, Big Woods, Thursday, May 27th from 6.45 to 8.30. We also encourage you to join us for other events here through Wild Ones. And as we um, also wanted to mention, the very active Wild Ones Facebook group where you can connect with your colleagues and friends that can help you out with some of your questions as well. We would like to thank the following individuals for their significant contributions in conceiving the idea for the program and or seeing the project through its completion. Marty Agler, Jen Ainsworth, Denise Gehring, Susan Hall, Janice Hand, Katie Hebner, Elaine Krasinski, David Krasiniak, Myself, Matthew Ross, Pam Todd, and Sally Wenzel. We searched the nation to find top designers that have been designing native landscapes and have been delighted with the response of the designs created by both Carmen and Susie and the other talented designers. I know by tonight's response, you were all wowed by their uh, innovative designs and we encourage you to take a look at them online. You can view the native garden designs at nativegardendesigns.wildones.org. We also encourage you to join and become a member of the Wild Ones organization at members.wildones.org slash join. For those of you that are interested, we'd also love to see the gardens that you installed or install in the future based on the seven designs that were presented by a very generous donate or very generous grant by the Stanley Smith Horticultural Trust and show us how they evolve over time. By becoming a member of Wild Ones, you get access to current electronic issues of the quarterly Wild Ones journal. We did post a, a journal article that Susie presented uh, not too long ago. So if you go back into the chat, you'll see that link. But we have experts that share their knowledge through the Wild Ones journal. We have invitations to workshops, garden tours, seed exchanges, plant sales, and stewardship projects. There's discounts for partner educational webinars, such as the NDAL and Wild Ones chapter programs. Participation in national photo contest. It was fun judging some of the, working with the judges for the national photo contest this year and seeing the beauty of native plants through the lens. You get access to the Wild Ones member center for learning resources, participation in Wild for Monarchs and native garden recognition programs, involvement in citizen science and networking with conservation partners and receipt of Wild Ones national e-newsletters. There's so many other ways that Wild Ones is helping change the world by encouraging the planting of native plants. One question that was asked today is, how do we know what organizations might be proficient in the use of native plants in design and how to connect with nurseries and landscape professionals? Well, one way for those of you that are landscape professionals and nursery, uh, nurseries that are focused on native plants is to be sponsoring the Wild Ones Journal. You can get a full page sponsorship for $320, a half page for $215, and so on. The Wild Ones Journal is an award-winning publication, and we encourage you to check it out. Before we stop tonight's recording, I wanted to remind you that it will be available on our YouTube page, and that you can check that out. The previous Meet the Designers has already had over a thousand views, and we know that based on the response today, that Carmen and Susie, you're going to have a lot of fans out there because you did such a fantastic job tonight. We want to thank you again for joining us and for sharing your insight into the designs with our Wild Ones audience. So thank you, everyone. We wish you a great evening and a happy spring.